Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Frank Hall, and uh, I'm new at Saginaw Valley State University as the Dean of Science, Engineering, and Technology. And let's see if I can get this to work. Okay. And I want to take you on a journey, a journey of exploration, a journey of learning, and hopefully a journey of understanding. As someone who has been a STEM professional uh, for most, pretty much my entire adult life, um, there are things that I've learned about this thing called STEM. Now, now, we all know what the acronym STEM is because since President George W. Bush brought this word out during one of his State of the Union addresses, everything we've heard about has been STEM, 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 STEM. Science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. They're the innovators. They're the ones who are going to push the economy. They're going to want to make our lives easier. STEM, STEM, STEM. And we're worried because we say that, you know, we're not producing enough STEM people. We're not getting enough STEM professionals. And so we worry about that. But we don't think about the process. What does it, what does it take to become a STEM professional? So we're going to go on a little bit of a journey about the things that I've learned over time. And hopefully that you'll recognize the fact that you in the audience and everyone who's listening has a role to play in this. Because you see, it does take a community to raise a teacher. It does take a community to get involved, to make things happen. And so, oops, sorry, get this way, yes. I used to be a faculty member uh, in the city of New Orleans prior to Hurricane Katrina. And I was working with New Orleans Public School. I want to give you an indication of what it was like in New Orleans prior to Hurricane Katrina. 95% of the students were African American in New Orleans Public Schools. What are 95%? More than 85% were on free or reduced lunch program. That means that we're talking about a high poverty area, high poverty schools in an urban environment down in the Mississippi Delta region. Within the state of Louisiana, there are 53 schools that were deemed to be unsatisfactory. Of those 53, 50 were in New Orleans. 50 out of 53. And when we have problems with our schools, we have problems with school districts, what's our common response? What's the first thing we say must be the problem? Well, the problem has to be, it's the teachers, right? We blame the teachers automatically. We ignore the fact that there's an entire system dedicated to education. And we look at this one point and we say, you know, it's the teacher's fault. Do you guys remember this back in 2010? Central Falls High School in Rhode Island fired all of his teachers. Remember the response by the Secretary of Education, Arne Duncan, who applauded this? Did anyone ask what's the administration's what was the administration doing when all this failing was going on? Did anyone ask what's the school board doing? Did anyone ask what are the parents doing? No. You fired all the teachers. And how many of us really thought that that was a problem? Isn't it easy, though? I mean, let's face reality. When I started working with teachers in New Orleans, there were some major problems. They were woefully underprepared. Give you an example had STEM teachers who didn't know how to use a ruler. When I say didn't know how to use a ruler, they did, could not measure the side of a square or a triangle using a ruler. We had teachers who could not determine a sine, cosine, or tangent of an angle using their calculators. That is what we were dealing with. People tend to forget that these are college graduates, by the way. People forget that they went through the certification process, by the way. So there was something going on, something wrong. My argument is that it was not the teachers failing, but we as communities are failing. And failing our schools, we're also failing our children. And they're the ones we want to become STEM professionals someday, right? The class of, 20, uh, of 2032 is being born right now. What's their life going to be before they come to university? You all remember the quote by Albert Einstein, his definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results? We've been doing the same thing over and over and over again, and somehow we expect that the results are going to change. Well, you know, here are some of my perspectives on STEM and STEM education. But why do we want STEM education in the first place? Well, first of all, we do want people to have the knowledge of STEM, of science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and the processes that are associated with it. We want them to come to our universities and become majors in these fields. And we want them to become professionals. We want them to be adult professionals in the STEM fields because that is where we say our innovation is. Without 
this focus on K-12 STEM education. We're not going to have the STEM majors at the university. If we don't have the STEM majors at the university, it means that we're not going to be producing the STEM professionals that we want to lead us as we progress to the, to the 21st century. Who's going to be our innovators without these professionals? We need to build capacity that's going to advance community and STEM education. We need to look at the resources and we need to utilize them so that we can advance this idea within the community. We need to look at physical, economic, personnel, bring them together. We as members of the community need to be personally involved because it is our future that we're talking about. Community-based approaches are important because number one, they build capacity. Community-based approaches look at all the, com all the components and resources and brings them together to help to build that capacity. When we look at a student, we look at, it, at the influence in our lives, this is one of the things that I learned that's really important because we tend to look at education as I'll drop my child off at school and someone in front of the classroom is going to teach my child everything they need to know and I don't have to worry anymore. But that is not how children or adults learn because there are so many influences. Of course, the school and the teacher. What about the families? What's life like at home? Are the parents supportive? Are the brothers and sisters supportive? What about the community itself? Does the child feel safe within that community? Can a child go outside and play? Does a child want to go outside and play? Does that child feel safe? What about their peers? What are their peers saying is important? What are the peers saying to do? Peer pressure, we know, is really difficult as an adult, but don't forget how difficult peer pressure is when you're a child, especially when you're in middle school and high school. And one thing I learned by working in a high-poverty environment is what's their access to social services? If a parent has to take four buses to get down to, to an office because, because of the fact that they need the food stamps or whatever else, How's that going to impact that child? How's it going to impact the learning? What are social services are available and can they take advantage of them so that they can do better in, uh, with respect to their learning? We have to stop blaming everyone else. We have to stop saying, it's not my fault. We have to stop saying, it's not my school district. We have to stop saying that it's their problem. It's our problem. Because whether you like it or not, no one is born with the idea of, some, of someday, I'm going to be a failure. And whether, it's a, whether it is a city or county or town next door, it is a part of our community. We need to put our energies to assure success and stop blaming people for whenever there's a failure. Community-based approaches integrate theory and practice. We know what we need to do. There's been enough research done. There's been enough theories out there. Now we have to take that, we have to integrate it into practice. Community-based projects emphasize the needs of the stakeholder. Who are the stakeholders? I know as dean of the College of Science, Engineering, and Technology, I'm a stakeholder because the ones who come to my university and major in my college come from the K-12 school system, whether it's a public school or private school, or whether they're homeschool. I'm a stakeholder. The companies and corporations around here are stakeholders. You are a stakeholder. Because if you have a smartphone in your pocket, someone has to develop that smartphone that you're using right now. When you look at community-based approaches, number one, you've got to remember that people recognize the fact that they're not alone. Because no one can do it alone. That you are valued and people know that they are safe. Safety is a critical issue. The fact that if I know that I'm safe, that it is okay for me to do is very, very important. So improving education requires that we all participate. We all do something to come out there that's going to advance K-12 education and especially K-12 STEM education. So why focus on teaching? Well, think about it for a second. Where do we learn everything? Where do we learn about life? Where do we learn life lessons? Where do we learn the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic? We learn them in schools. That's where we formally prepare people for life. 
Teachers just happen to be the conduits through which this, teaching, which this learning occurs. Teachers are the ones who are presenting the information or guiding children and adults to learning. They're the conduits for this. And we've got to remember, teachers are a part of our community. They are not external to our community. They are a part of our community. They are our brothers and our sisters and our cousins. They are a part of the community in which we live. And they need to be valued for what they bring to it. So as members of the community, think about the value that teachers bring to society. If we look, for example, if you want to put a dollar amount on it, try to do that. Try to imagine people who are advancing technology today who didn't go to school, who didn't have education. We may talk about a certain individual who may have dropped out of Harvard to start a billion-dollar tech company. Well, maybe that person dropped out of Harvard, but you know what? They graduated from high school, didn't they? So education, they bring value to education. Again, no one can do it alone. I was lucky. I had some wonderful collaborators when I was starting. They allowed me to ask dumb questions. They allowed me to propose ideas. And I learned a lot. You, have, you cannot do it alone. There is no silver bullet. There is no single thing you can do that's going to change the system. And you cannot do it alone. So I want to take, tell you real quick just what we did when I was in New Orleans. You know, we decided to focus on, and I say we because the fact of the matter is that it wasn't just me, it, it was others. We came together and we said, what can we do to try to improve the quality of teaching? And we decided to look at this environment around the university. I mean, so those of you may know, the city of New Orleans is on the southern shore of Lake Pontchartrain. You may have heard of Lake Pontchartrain. Wonderful place, wonderful environment to do science. And the university happens to be right on the south shore of Lake Pontchartrain. So we would take our teachers out in the field and they would actually do science. The same way the scientists who are doing research do science. We get them up to the lake and have them do water quality and other analyses. Then they would have to take what they learned and teach it. First teach it to each other to start getting into the practice of actually taking this content we want them to know and to start preparing in the lessons and to teach people and to get advice from other people. And then to take what they have learned and try it out. Go to a school. See how it works prior to you graduating from this university. And I particularly put up this, this particular student. I, I love her. She, she was wonderful. Because the very first day of class that I had her, she came up to me and she let me know that she didn't like me. And the very first day of class, she didn't like science. She made me know that the very first day of class. I went, oh, okay, um, okay, sure. Well, when I left University of New Orleans, she was the one that came to me and told me how angry she was at me because she said, you're the first person that ever made me like science and now you're leaving. Imagine that. I started sending my students out to uh, professional scientific forums, you know, science teachers associations and other things like that, as pre-service teachers. Pre-service means that you're not certified to be a teacher yet. All the programs that are out there, professional societies, were always set up for the people who are already teachers. And I said, you know what, I want you to start going now, before you become a teacher. So I started getting them to these, to these professional society programs. And then we started working with end-service teachers. End-service teachers, though you don't know, it's a term that just basically says that they're certified and they're in the classroom. And we took them to do some training. And at the very bottom picture, I know you can't read what, what's uh, written there, but uh, we took them out to a canoe, uh, on canoes, and they'd never been in a canoe before. And of course, safety first, you know, because everything you do, you have to be safe and you know, everything. And we, we tell them before, you know, getting in the canoe, we'd sit them down and say, okay, listen, canoes tip over. It, it, it happens, okay? And I know you're worried. So listen, this is what you do. If the canoe tips over, stand up. Because the water's only that high. 
And what you can't read about what the, uh, the person in the front is, the teacher, and the, and the person in the back is uh, another professor, colleague of mine. And what she wrote on there is, I can't believe I'm sitting in this canoe. And she, and she said later on, I'm not going to have my students do this. We're, we're going to come out here, we're going to do it. We take them out in the field, a group of teachers at a time, to learn about the environment around them. And in a picture on, on the right side, we actually had a combination. We brought teachers from Louisiana who work with teachers from uh, the state of, of West Virginia. And the important thing about that was the fact that they built community. They learned that there's actually a group of people who are interested in the same thing that they are. And not only does it build their uh, abilities as teachers, it builds their self-esteem, it, bu it builds their abilities to want to go out and teach anymore. So what do we do? Well, you know what? Number one, we look at our teachers and remind them, why did they come teachers in the first place? How many people do you know actually decide to go for a career where they know they're going to be criticized for doing their jobs by people who do not know what their jobs are? Why did they become a teacher in the first place? Support them, value them, let them know that they have meaning. Remind them that science is fun. Science is a whole lot of fun. Science isn't facts and figures. Science is a process. Doing science is fun. Sometimes we forget that because you get hung up on the little minutiae and details. But no, the process of science is fun. Remind them science is fun. I hope that you remember the fact that science is fun. So here's, here's some significant accomplishments. Ninety teachers from southeastern Louisiana participated in our, in our uh, pre-service, I mean, in, in our in-service program. And through analysis, we saw 40 percent improvement, 40 percent improvement in in-service teachers through our program. <laughs> Classroom observation de demonstrated that teachers were actually doing what we taught them. More than 95% of the 400 pre-service elementary school teachers I taught passed the science portion of the certification exam the first and only time they took it. More than 95%. More importantly, most importantly, the city of New Orleans, through our program, and by the way, remember, I didn't do it alone. I worked with other people. Within two years, standardized test scores for New Orleans public schools increased by 10%. Some schools increased by more than 50%. We're talking about a high poverty, high underrepresented student population, and we got those kind of results. And of course, this was prior to Hurricane Katrina. So what can you do? Well, get involved. Get involved in supporting your school and school districts where you, learn, where you live. If you see that a teacher or a school is failing, don't say, let's fire a teacher. Go back and say, what can I do to help? What do you need? I am there for you. Because at the end of the day, the teacher, the child, are all a part of your community. And you want your community to be successful, and you want those children to be successful. Come to, so come together at a community and show that you care about education. If someone says, this is the problem, walk away. Because there is no single problem. It's a community problem. Look at the entire process. Remember, people who we label as bad teachers, they're college graduates. They're not stupid. It's not easy graduating from college. I don't care what anyone says. I don't care what your major is. It's not easy to graduate from college. Remember that. And focus on the outcomes. Remember what it is that you want. Remember your goals. Support student learning. Give them an opportunity to have fun in science. And always remember that it takes a village to raise a teacher. Thank you.